When I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to fly into space and explore the unknown. But you know life. I work in an office, no windows. I'm a hypnotherapist. I help pe people with depression, anxiety, relationships, emotional trauma, that kind of thing. Nothing exciting. <laughs> Until recently. Several months ago, a colleague made an offhand comment about erotic hypnosis. I laughed. That's not a thing, I said. It's definitely a thing, he said. There's a whole fetish community for it. Dom, subs, the whole thing. Plus, there are a lot of therapeutic applications. You should check it out. I scoffed. Look, maggot, I'm not giving people orgasms in my office. I just had the carpets cleaned. <laughs> just check it out, he said. I checked it out. Um, Feel what it's like to tap into the true power that you have. That's right. So I, uh, I registered for the course. <laughs> Whoa, my friend Carla said when I showed her the video, you're going to this? Yep, I said. Bring wet naps, she suggested. I laughed. It's not like that, I said. Then I got on Amazon.com and ordered an ass load of wet naps. <laughs> on the hottest day of the summer, I packed my sensible gray Subaru with 10 days worth of conservative business casual clothes and rolled to Vegas for HypnoThoughts Live, one of the biggest hypnosis conventions in the world. All the greats were there and I geeked out for days on a huge variety of subjects. Pain control for cancer patients. Hypnosis for breakups, advanced psychodynamic loops, ethical considerations for trans workers, perfectly respectable and mainstream topics. But these brief workshops were merely teasers for the main course. When the weekend convention was over, I found myself seated in a small, well-lit ballroom with 25 other perverts <laughs> waiting for the crazy to begin. I looked around the room. There were about two dozen middle-aged white dudes, a couple of young guns, and a handful of very nervous women. <laughs> Look at these sick fucks, I whispered to myself as I took stock. Our teacher, Joseph, was a middle-aged fellow of some renown in hypnosis circles. He wore ornate vests of a type I would expect a magician to wear, which it turns out he sort of was. He had a bombastic delivery style that was unlike any of the trainings I'd attended in my career. He mocked convention. He made bold claims. He defied common knowledge. He made people come by snapping his fingers. I mean, I knew in theory what I was in for. I, I'd read the syllabus. But seeing and hearing someone moan, writhe, and scream with mounting pleasure while they sat in a chair was a somehow more profound experience than reading the handouts. <laughs> when it was done, we all applauded and the subject opened her eyes. She smiled like she just had the best sex of her life. And perhaps she had. That's all for now, Joseph said, but you don't get to learn this yet. I need to know you've got the basics and you need to clean your own shit up. I was about to reach into my briefcase for the wet naps when he continued. <laughs> By shit, I mean your own baggage. If you want to experience this or facilitate it for someone else, you've got to clean up your own stuff. You have to heal your judgments, your inhibitions and traumas first. I knew I didn't have any of those problems, <laughs> but I nodded, playing along. Pair up and run the basics, Joseph said. Put each other in trance and then switch. Get it done. The women in the room were outnumbered by lecherous, oversexed old dudes, and I felt like I had to protect them. So I grabbed Lacey, a young woman with long curly hair, a vaguely southern accent, and a gap so big I could have driven my car through it. I put her in trance quickly, and then I counted her back up, safe and sound. But that's not what she'd been after. Did you even do anything? She asked, her eyes narrowing. I put you in trance. <clears throat> yeah, but I don't feel any different, she said. I don't think you did anything. You were drooling, I said. You were in trance. Yeah, but I feel the same. You didn't do anything. 
We weren't supposed to do anything. Whatever, she said, and rolled her eyes. Are you ready to go under for me or what? Not for you, bitch, I thought. <laughs> but I walled off my mind and thought of the buffet while she did her thing. And this became a pattern. I was happy to perform hypnosis on the other students, but when Joseph called for us to switch, I ignored him until the time ran out. I wasn't going under for these weirdos. The next day, Joseph dropped some truth on us. You are not hypnotists, he said gravely. You are reality engineers. You're here to make people feel good all the time for no goddamn reason. Society has taken that away from us. Your job is to give it back. Honestly, this shook me. I came from simple working class white people. We didn't get to feel good for no reason. We were Scandinavian for fuck's sake. We had to earn pleasure and then we were obligated to feel ashamed about it. Joseph went on. A word of warning, he said, before he began the curriculum. When you're dealing with sex and hypnosis, you're gonna hit on some unconscious stuff. Eventually, someone's gonna abreact and you'd better know how to handle it. Abreactions were intense but rare. I'd handled only a few in my career. Sudden, intense discharges of painful emotions from a subject in hypnosis. In my first training years ago, the teacher was insistent that the best and only thing to do was to get an abreacting client out of hypnosis as fast as possible. But not Joseph. If it happens, don't shut it down, he said. Don't bring them out of trance. An abreaction is the fastest access to their baggage, and you can and you will help them heal it in that moment. Whatever, I thought. I'd probably dealt with more abreactions than anyone in this room. I wasn't scared of them or Joseph. That day we learned a new technique called the pleasure dial. People were moaning and screaming so loud that someone from the corporate board meeting next door called hotel security. <laughs> when the cray cray was over, Joseph came up to me and complimented my skills. You're great at this, he said, almost a natural. Almost? I asked, grinning smugly. To be a natural, you have to be as good at receiving as you are at giving, he said. I started to make a joke, but he cut me off. Get vulnerable, he said. I felt heat rising in my face. When we do fantasy lover protocol, Joseph said, you go first. <laughs> fantasy lover protocol. I swallowed hard. FLP was the elicitation of the subject's perfect lover in trance. It was the subject's deepest, truest fantasy, made utterly real with the power of their own mind. I was excited to learn the technique, but not to have it done to me by anyone here. Fuck no. But Joseph was watching. After lunch, Charles, the biggest man in the room, sat next to me. Charles was a retired software developer from Minnesota. He had wild curly hair and wore David Koresh glasses that slipped down his nose a lot. Can I do it to you first, he asked. Grudgingly, I agreed and planned to go through the motions and get through this, just as I had done all week. What happened next is really hard to describe in words, and I'm a writer, but I'll never truly capture what happened to me on this day. Hundreds of times I told my clients that the unconscious mind does not use words. It uses metaphor, story, and symbol. Its language is dreams, impressions, and feelings. Feelings that I had bottled up all week in this alienating place with these oversexed derelicts. But this time there would be no getting out of it. Charles did his thing. I closed my eyes when asked. I listened to his voice and my body and mind relaxed. Deeper and deeper now and suddenly I'm sinking, sinking, sinking. I hear Charles' voice distantly, but I'm ignoring it. Something inside me is taking control. This isn't what's supposed to happen. Abort, I think, abort. And then I'm stepping through a doorway. And now I'm standing beneath a night sky awash with a billion stars. In front of me, a small fire crackles. A hooded figure is standing on the other side of the fire. It is a woman. And when she pulls the hood down to reveal her face in the flickering firelight, it is not my fantasy lover. It is heartbreak. 
It is Sherry, one of the women in the room that I'd worked with, the nervous Midwestern lady who felt so uncomfortable in this class. I worked with her just once. I tried to save her from these men. Now the woman's face shifts and it's my grandmother. I feel a mounting horror. It's my dead grandmother. As a child, she'd lost her father and then her stepfather to war. As a young woman, she'd been shamed by the infidelity of her first husband, a sailor on deployment. I feel tears rolling down my cheeks and I can't stop it. I feel my body shake with sobs and I cannot stop it. And I hate it. And now this woman is my mother, the product of my grandmother's shame. And I see now so clearly the cost of that shame and that my mother never stood a chance. She died from a drug overdose, broken and utterly estranged from our family when I was 21. A week before she died, I dreamed that time was running out, that I had to find her, and I did not. I did not. She died with that shame. She died of that shame, and I had not saved her. And now her shame is my shame. The fire rises. She is burning alive and she is screaming. And it is me. This woman is me. And I am burning now with shame. It is the hottest, darkest flame I have ever known. I fight it with rage, railing against it for 100 years. For a thousand more, it consumes me with no end. I burn in eternal shame in this place. I hear from very far away that the instructor is calling on us to wrap it up. I hear Charles, concerned, urging me back to the room. Because I realize I am abreacting. I am having a trans freak out. It's not a client, it's not a subject, it's fucking me. There's a little boy inside, a scared little boy that wants me to leave. He's embarrassed and he wants people to like him and he wants to be safe. He tries to lead me away from the fire, but something else takes shape. Something new and primal and terrible. It holds me here under the fire, under the water. A torture so loving and so ferocious that I laugh and sob at once, and I am drowning and I am burning. And suddenly I know why I'm here. I have to bring the cycle to an end, and I'm the only one who can. I hear Joseph urging us to finish again. Fuck you, a hoarse voice whispers. I notice distantly that it's mine. And my breath feeds the fire that burns me now. The fire consumes me the way it consumed these women I loved, my ancestors going back a hundred generations. They carried a terrible burden, this toxic thing, this terrible, shameful rot. So I do the only thing I can, I burn until it has eaten me, until the fire has burned out because there is nothing left. I'm reduced to ash and blown away, falling into nothingness. And then there's suddenly something else. Unlike anything I've ever felt, it's a, it's a feeling at first. It pours through me. It flows down into me through every level of my being until the atoms that make up my body and all the space in those atoms and all the spaces between them are singing with this feeling. I'm not falling. I'm flying. The shame is gone and I am free. And I'm not alone. She is smiling, the woman in the hooded robe. She is holding her hand out to me. I'm holding my hand out to myself. I take her hand. In that simple embrace is everything words cannot say. 10,000 secrets, the story of a family and of one man, me. And this story is not a tragedy. I was never meant to be a hero. I was never meant to save them. I was meant to save myself. And this story is a beginning. I come back into the room, my face tight with dried tears. I realize Charles is holding me, keeping me from falling out of the chair. He looks at me hard, his face etched with concern. Whoa, I say. <laughs> yeah, he says, pushing his birth control glasses up the bridge of his nose. 
Whoa. Thank you, I say, and he pats me on the shoulder. You needed that, he says. I guess I did. Something I can't describe has shifted inside me. There, there's more of me now. I can feel it. I never even noticed that it was lost before, but it came back and it brought friends, clarity and freedom and power and joy. And it happened in minutes while I sat in this shitty chair in this shitty hotel ballroom while a stranger held me and talked to me about bikini models. And that's why I love hypnosis, erotic or not. You need a minute, Charles asks. Nope, I say. Buckle up, Chuck, and take off those glasses. <laughs> then I dropped Charles through the fucking floor and made him moan like the beast he was. <laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to explore the mysteries of space and time. But I've let go of that dream. I'm living a better one. I'm a psychonaut. <laughs> and the mysteries I explore, the ones inside us, are infinite and powerful and richer and deeper than any out there. Plus, you know, the inside ones come with uh, orgasms, <laughs> if we want. Thank you. That was J.D. Burke.